Yep, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dantel Proctor from the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. Welcome to today's webinar, Early Warning Systems Facilitating Effective ABC Data and Intervention Meetings. To start, I would like to share some brief details about today's webinar. Our presenters are Johan Liljengren and Felicia Walker from the National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center. Both Johan and Felicia have worked on early warning systems as part of the Talent Development Secondary Project at the Everyone Graduate Center at Johns Hopkins University. Today's webinar will last for approximately 60 minutes with time for questions. We will be placing everyone on mute. Please do not unmute yourself, but instead refer to the chat function on the right side, actually, I'm sorry, at the top of the screen if you have a question. Please feel free to log your questions as presenters are talking, and we'll leave some time at the end to answer them. If we don't have enough time to get through all of the questions, we will reply to participants by email within the next five to seven days. We encourage you to ask questions or simply share a comment. Also, we'd like to ask you to participate in a brief survey at the end of the webinar. The information you share will help inform our future webinars. Today's webinar is one of a number being offered by the Technical Assistance Center during 2017. The center is new. It is funded by the Department of Education, specifically the Office of Safe and Healthy Students. Our website is currently being developed and we hope to have it up and running um, sometime this month. Before I hand over to Johan, I wanted to share with you the mission of our National Center. The mission of the Center is to disseminate evidence-based practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school, and succeed academically so that they graduate high school prepared for college, career, and civic life. Johan, I pass it on to you now. All right, it's great. Thanks, Santa. Um, and I just wanted to double check. We have a couple of other folks who are on the call as well. Uh, both Felicia Walker um, and Sean uh, Morris. Um, so I wanted to see uh, if those folks are on the line as well before we jump into our agenda. So Sean and Felicia, are you guys on? Yes, Johan, I'm here. Yeah, we're on. Great. Thanks, yeah. Felicia. Um, and Sean, did I hear you as well? Yeah, we're on. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Great. Um, okay, uh, thanks guys. I just wanted to make sure we were, uh, you guys were there before we, we jumped in and got started. Um, so Felicia, I'm going to have, um, if you can move uh, to a uh, few slides in advance, I'm going to talk through a couple of things before we get started, um, kind of an overview of our some of the things our center is working on, um, as well as kind of an introduction to early warning system. Um, so as Duntel mentioned, um, uh, we are a new new center funded out of the U.S. Department of Education, um, really focused on two big areas of work to, to start. Um, one is a continuation of, of a success mentors project that was started last year, really focused on addressing chronic absenteeism. So there are 30 cities across the country um, that are working as part of this uh, My Brother's Keeper Success Mentors Network, and we're, we're continuing the support for those cities um, uh, throughout the through this center. Um, the other part of it is that we are working um, with uh, SIG eligible or priority schools. I know SIG is no longer in its same format. It will be uh, a new a new format. Um, but working on trying to um, help schools in that priority status or school improvement status um, using early warning systems, especially a focus on chronic absenteeism. Um, so that one we're trying to spread um, more broadly practices that we um, have been shown to be effective um, as well as um, as trying to build build communities around this work and, and build conversations. So um, as we mentioned, we have a um, website coming soon um, and uh, we'll be able to house a lot of our, our different information um, at, that, at that website um, when it's up and running. All right. Um, at, couple of convenings that we have coming up. Um, so uh, the, you can reach out with uh, so the contact information um, if you have questions about our mailing list or coaching support. Um, we are doing some in-person visits um, and our big event that's upcoming is April 3rd and 4th. We have a virtual convening. Um, we're going to be sharing information around how we can use chronic absenteeism, how we can use um, early warning systems to, um, to 
think about and address our ESSA plans. So a big focus right now is this shift to state ESSA plans. How do we incorporate these items? So April 3rd and 4th, we're really excited about that event. Um, and so encourage you to, to reach out and, and um, register for that. Um, that's uh, our first upcoming. Um, all right, so I think that's the, um, the main um, slides. What we're going to talk through today, I'm going to do a quick introduction around early warning systems, and it might be a little bit of a review for folks who have uh, participated in some of these before, but want to make sure we're all on the same page for that, um, and share a few things we've seen from just kind of from background research in terms of setup um, that I think are important to think about. Uh, Felicia is going to talk us through kind of some general guidelines on effective ABC data and intervention review meetings. And then we're really excited to have Sean Morris here. Um, and I think Sean might have uh, some of his colleagues with him as well, a principal from um, middle school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who has been um, a part of an early warning systems project this year. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like at their school. Um, so excited to have them join us and be able to, to share kind of what it looks like from, from a leader's standpoint in doing that. So that's our, our agenda for today. Um, so to start with, uh, just a little bit of background on kind of what, what early warning systems are and why we think they're so important. Um, we know there's huge implications for, for a student uh, for dropping out of high school, disengaging and dropping out. Um, we've seen for an individual that is more likely to be unemployed, incarcerated, have health issues, and oftentimes pass these on from generation to generation. Um, so obviously it has huge implications for an individual student. Um, but as importantly as that is that we also see that that can congregate that in, in certain neighborhoods, in certain cities, in certain states that has a huge impact on that community. Um, so it has a much broader reach than just that one student. It impacts our whole, um, our, really our whole country. Um, so, so that's the first thing is we know it has huge costs when students don't graduate. The other thing um, on the positive side is we've seen good progress in our nation's graduation rate. So this chart, um, we have, um, you can see this different graduation rates um, based on the uh, different colors um, and statewide graduation rates. So we've seen good progress. We're actually above 80%, just above 82% um, as a nation, um, a, a nation's graduation rate, and have made enormous progress in the last 15 years um, in improving that over 10 percentage points. So really good news in that more kids are graduating. Um, the challenge in that is that you see there's variation. Um, in this chart, um, that there are some states where the graduation rate is still lower, um, and you see in some states where it is higher. Um, and if you would break a state down um, within that, you would see counties and cities um, that have differences. Um, and so we see it geographically. We also see it with different groups. So we, our students who are low income are still graduating at lower rates um, than, than other students. So we still have there are still pockets and groups of students who are not graduating at the same rate. So we still see special education students who are graduating at much lower rates. So we know we've made good progress, but we also know we have a lot of work to do to target this and make sure we're, we're providing the supports where, where we can. Um, so what our early warning systems are really designed to do is to, to be the, the early intervention tools. So early warning systems are aimed at improving attendance, student effort and engagement, improving course passage and achievement, improving promotion rates, and ultimately impacting graduation rates years later. Um, so how do we think about early warning systems? So I'll share one study that we have thought of and that has really influenced how we've, we've thought about this um, approach. So um, we looked at all of these different factors about students. So trying to look, this one is actually from a study in Philadelphia. So sixth grade kids, trying to figure out what are the things that are most predictive, what are these char what characteristics of a student are most predictive of a student that would be um, likely to disengage or likely to not disengage from school. Um, and we found um, basically three different big things that came out of that. Um, so those three things were students who had a poor attendance, um, students who had a poor behavior mark on their report card, um, and this one actually was a, it's actually a behavior much like a behavior grade, more common in an elementary school. Um, it was not suspensions for this one. Um, and they had failed a math or a literacy um, at the end of sixth grade. So we think of those as the ABCs, attendance, behavior, and course performance. And what we saw with the kids who had any one of those is that only one in 10 of those students was graduating six years later. Um, so if you had 10 kids who had, who had failed sixth grade math, um, one of those kids was graduating. Um, uh, six years later. So obviously it has huge implications for that student um, and you can really tell who that student is. 
So, so I shared one study. There's a bunch of other ones, and we are actually in a couple of our webinars are digging deeper into some of the research behind this. But it's really helped us think about early warning systems. What does that data show in a couple of ways? So, one, it's this idea of success factors and risk factors. So obviously, if you're failing a sixth grade course, it is a huge red flag risk factor. Um, so concern, that's a red or yellow flag. Um, we need to be concerned about that. The other side of that is we're really seeing it's the high achievement in those categories that is college or career ready. Um, so it's not just not getting an F, but the students who are able to achieve A and B levels, those are the students that are virt virtually, all of them are graduating from high school and many of them are succeeding in college, and they're succeeding at higher rates in college than kids who have C's and D's as an average. So, so again, I think it's really helped us think about this. It's not just like a way to flag students who are at risk or waving their hands, kind of our red flags, but also to help us think about how do we push kids to higher achievement, um, especially with uh, course performance and, um, and attendance we see. Um, the other things, these second two are paired together. Um, it's that students really are oftentimes flagging and signaling multiple years before they totally disengage from school. I think is actually a good sign. Um, it's showing that we have time to respond and it's, and it's showing that kids are resilient. They're coming back. They're trying even when they're struggling or failing. Um, so how do, we, how do we respond to that? And we also see the kids develop more indicators over time. So they start with one and sometimes develop more. Um, so it really gives us a sense that we, we can intervene, we can respond. So, and then lastly, we just need to acknowledge that there are a lot of things that go into this. Um, what goes into good attendance, what goes into good practices around course performance. Um, we have to acknowledge that, um, that that will really help us as we're thinking about interventions. All right, so this is about my last overview one is that we think about early warning systems and oftentimes um, when folks hear that word, they hear they think of the data system. You know, what is the what is the data system that that gives me my red flag, that tells me who I need to worry about, that tells me trends, um, and that is definitely a, an important side of this. We need reliable, valid, predictive indicators that help people make decisions, move to action, um, to support students. So we need we know that that is important. However, on the flip side of that. Um, if we don't pair that with an intervention or response system, um, we really won't be making progress. Um, so we have, uh, we really need to pair these two together. So we've really been trying to think of early warning systems as not just a data system, but it's a data and intervention system. So think of those two things together. Um, so for today, what we're going to talk about is kind of how do you meet around these indicators? What is the, how do you, you know, you have this data, how do you meet around those? Um, and I want to make the, the argument is that if you're really doing this in a full, robust way, um, you're actually meeting around these indicators at multiple levels of your school. So um, your leadership team is looking at trend data. They are helping set up teachers or other support staff to use that data themselves. Um, so they are well versed and able to use that, um, use pieces of it. You might have a team, an EWS team or a small learning community team. Um, some of these are, you know, might be an MTSS, multi-tiered student supports, or a PBIS team. So there's definitely some overlap in these types of things. But these folks are helping plan school-wide initiatives for prevention. They're setting up systems for data, data analysis and monitoring. In some cases, they might actually be talking about an individual kid. Um, if uh, the next level, that you have teams of teachers, so grade-level teams or interdisciplinary teams that could be doing that work together um, and be talking about students. Um, and also setting up just the culture and relationships um, that, that we know are the preventative work. Um, and then lastly, kind of our student support team, our most intensive work uh, of interventions for students. So, thinking it's most robust, um, we are doing this at all levels. Um, however, we don't always see that, you know, that every school is, is going to be taking that on, or it, especially to start with, they might not be taking that on. So um, this is our general, um, general approach and what we've recommended if schools are just getting started. If you have 0 to 20 students who have one of those red flags, we think that it can really be one, one or two people who lead that effort. So a counselor or a social worker, or someone who's leading that effort by themselves. If you feel like you have 20 to 50 kids that are meeting that, that have a flag that you're concerned about, we really think you need to have some kind of dedicated team. 
So how does that team help do some of the proactive work as well as the intervention work? Um, and then lastly, if you have more than 50 students, you have to think about how do you expand that to meet more students across your school? How do you engage more adults in that work? Um, it can't be just a small number of folks. All right, and then my last one that I'll share is I think it's in its most robust, um, we talk about this as an interdisciplinary teacher team. So an EWI meeting or an ABC intervention meeting um, is a team of teachers who are sitting around, they all have students that they share and they're talking about how do we respond to these students? How do we look at this data? How do we take what we know and how do we respond? Um, so that teacher team is really owning both the intervention side as well as some of that positive um, side around the ABCs that you see on the left hand um, part of this slide. So what we're going to talk about today, um, and I'm going to pass off to Felicia for this next one, is really how do you take, how do you think about what does that meeting actually look like? Um, what does that meeting look like where you're sitting down talking about individual kids? How do you keep that organized? How do you keep it efficient? Um, make it a good use of, of everybody's time. So, so I'll pass it off to Felicia to give a little bit um, of an overview of kind of what we've learned on that um, and then um, get a chance to hear from Sean and his team about um, how it has worked at their first school. All right. Well, thank you, Johan. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Awesome. So uh, as Johan said, we're going to talk today about early warning meetings or data meetings where you talk about students, uh, you review data, and it also involves intervention analysis. So the purpose of this is to coordinate, create, and monitor interventions for students who are exhibiting early warning indicators. As Johan talked about earlier, those indicators are attendance, behavior, and course performance. So what are you actually doing during those meetings? One of the main things you're going to do, and we're going to talk about uh, this a little later, is reviewing ABC data. And it does make a difference how that data is presented, how it looks to the people at the meeting uh, in order to have an effective meeting. And one of the main things you're going to do is you're going to share information during those meetings. And I stress that all known information on behalf of the student is very important to be shared at that time. Regardless of your position in the school, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a, a, an AP in the school or the principal, any information when we start to talk about a certain student uh, needs to be shared in order for us to assign the most effective intervention. Which is your next step as far as a task? You want to assign an intervention and also assign a champion someone that's going to be responsible to make sure that that intervention is actually done and also to report out on the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of that intervention. And always at your data review meetings, you're going to be following up on student progress, seeing if the intervention is working or not. So one of the important things that you need to consider as you're having your data review meetings is what are the roles of some of the participants going to be during the meeting? One of them is going to be the recorder. And that person is going to be completing documentation. Um, first of all, they're going to include the students that you're talking about, any interventions that are discussed, who the champion is, when that deadline to check in on that intervention is, and just completing any other action plans or spreadsheet documents that you currently complete during that time. A key role is going to be the timekeeper. And this person is important because they want to ensure that as we're having these data review meetings, that we're staying on the time schedule, which I'm going to share with you in a few slides, which is our protocol that we ask you to follow. And the reason why this is important is because as an educator, we all know that when we start to talk about students, the conversation can uh, get off topic and get off task. So it's very important that that timekeeper is aware of the different time slots allotted to talk about different issues. The next one is the facilitator. This person is going to ensure that norms and the protocols are being followed. So we would suggest that all teams establish norms of some kind. Prior to starting the meeting, that should be done, and you may even want to list it at the top of your agenda 
to keep everyone informed of what those norms are on a continuous basis. And the facilitator is also going to uh, help with the assigning of these different team meeting roles. One of the key things is that everyone in attendance is participating. Regardless if we're talking about a student that you have or you currently had, it is very important that you be able to discuss and share out about different intervention ideas related to the indicator being discussed for a particular student. Some very good resources that we've used in the past and I found very valuable uh, are two listed here. And uh, one is the Skilled Facilitator, and the other is Adaptive Schools and Cognitive Coaching. They have really good strategies on how to conduct a, an effective meeting and also how to uh, prepare the facilitator for the different meetings and what skills that facilitator may need or use to have an effective meeting. So when we look at the data review meetings, some of the key components are the scheduling. So you want to make sure that you know who's going to attend and that they are aware that there is a scheduled meeting. So maybe sending out an email reminder a few days before the meeting and then also sending out a reminder the day of or the day before. And also with scheduling, you want to decide how often will these meetings be held. And for me, I would say that consistency is the biggest key to share with you for that because you want to start having these meetings on a regular basis so you can see the impact that they're having on student success. The next side of that is teams and attendees. And this is going to go over what do the teams do while they're at the meeting? How is the meeting ran? What's the process and procedure for having an effective meeting? And also, what are the tasks of the participants? So the, when you look at the meeting facilitation structures and protocol, you want to make sure that the process is consistent. Like I said before, you want to also make sure that the scheduling is consistent as well. And then you want to know and be sure that the conversations that you're having are geared towards action. Another important part of your meeting is looking at your tiered interventions. Does your school have a variety of resources and interventions that align with the student's need. And we're going to take a look at a sample resource map in a few minutes, which is a great way to structure and organize those tiered interventions. Also, student level data and tracking tools. How is the data presented at your meeting? Is it easily accessible? Is it uh, user friendly? And also, are you using it to make decisions, whether that's uh, interventions, or follow up to an intervention? And are you documenting what you're doing? And are you monitoring and following up on those actions? So as I mentioned earlier, one key component or team role is the timekeeper. And as you can see on the slide, it's very important and it could be challenging when you first start off as to how can I talk about one student in six to seven minutes. It can be done. And when it's done, the time moves very quickly, but the meetings are very effective and productive. And we've seen a lot of success as far as schools starting off with this process. So the first component of that is you identify the student. And then a lot of time is one to two minutes. So at that point, you're identifying who the student is, what the off-track indicator the student is exhibiting, and then you want to share what data point you use to validate that intervention. So that should take less than one to two minutes. The second part is the team providing the information. So when you first start off, it may be very hard to try to cover this in two to three minutes, but I'm telling you that with practice, it's very, very possible. So this is where the team members will share out about the student. And I always like to stress that sharing out about the student's strengths is always important because every student has something positive that you should be able to share. And that is very important when you start to discuss uh, the indicators 
that the student is having because it could impact the intervention that you're assigning. You also want to share about the student the interventions that you've already tried in the past that are related to that indicator. And then if there are other team members who can provide additional information, during this two to three minute time frame is when we ask that the other team members share out about any, uh, any additional information that they can provide. And sometimes this may be a social worker or a nurse or another teacher who's spoken with the parent um, prior to the meeting. So there are a lot of different uh, ways that the team members could have additional information, and we just ask that during that two to three minute time that you share it at that time. And then lastly, you want to use three to five minutes to consult your resource map. And this is where your tiered interventions are going to be found. And this is what you're going to use as a resource to determine what interventions have we already tried, so what interventions do we still have available to try for this student. And that's all going to be based on that indicator that the student is exhibiting. Once you've decided on what that intervention is going to be, then you're going to assign a champion. And as I stated before, that champion is going to follow up to make sure, one, that the intervention is being done, and then, two, to determine whether it's having an impact on the student as far as is the student making progress after being assigned that intervention. So they're going to be responsible for reporting out to the group the impact of that intervention. And the third thing is that you're going to determine what is a good follow-up date for the assigned intervention. Some interventions may be a phone call, so that could be something done within 24 to 48 hours. Other interventions are going to involve students actually trying out, for example, tutoring. If we're assigning a student tutoring for math, it may take longer than 48 hours to 72 hours to determine whether or not that intervention is effective. So that's an intervention that we would want to assign maybe a week or even two weeks to decide whether that is becoming effective. But as far as many follow-ups, the champion could find out if the student is actually showing up. So it's not waiting two weeks to find out if the student is showing up. That's something that you can check in on consistently. And then the last one that you see, determining communication with family, that's on an as-needed basis. If there is information that's discussed that the family should know right away, then yes, you would want to contact the family. But every time that you have a meeting, you do not necessarily need to reach out to the family. So that's on a case-by-case, as-needed basis. So as you can see, you're accomplishing a lot, but if you stay on the time that's indicated, you'll have a lot of success, and it will be a very productive and effective meeting. Not easy at first <laughs> as you get used to the time frames, but trust me, it will get easier and you will be able to do it. So as I mentioned before, this is an example of a resource map, and what you would want to do prior to the meeting is to develop this and create this with your team. And this resource map is something that's continuously updated, so I like to call it a running document. And what you're going to look at is what is available in our schools in each indicator and then at what tier level. So tier one is going to be what do we do for the entire school when we look at attendance, behavior, and course performance. What do we do for certain groups, whether that's a grade level, whether it's a gender base, whether it's a classroom? But what do we do for a targeted group of students as it refers to attendance, behavior, and course performance? And lastly, tier three, what do we do for that one-on-one -on -one attention to students who have an indicator in attendance, behavior, or course performance? So the tier three column is where you're going to focus mostly on when you're having the data review meetings, unless you're reviewing trends of data. And then you would probably focus on the level two or level one. So I strongly encourage you to try this activity out with your teams 
prior to the meeting because, again, you're going to be on a strict time schedule or strict time protocol to talk about the students, so you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what interventions are available. You already want that information printed out and available to the participants of the meeting. So as I mentioned earlier, you're going to be reviewing data. And it's important that, as you see here, you have data that's easily to, easy to read and user-friendly. And I say that because right away, looking at this data, I can tell immediately who's, who's off track in each indicator, what students need assistance with course performance, what students need assistance with behavior. I can also identify, looking at the yellows, which students are not off track yet, but they need some intervening possibly so they don't end up being off track. And then I also can see which students are doing well, which is indicated by the green color. The reason why you'll see two columns under each indicator is because you always want to also, when possible, have something to compare your current data to. So for this sample, we're looking at data that was uh, provided in September, and we're looking at quarter four or the prior year ending to see how that student is doing at the beginning of the new year versus how the student did at the end of the previous year. So as we go on, the student might do better when we go to quarter two, and we would look at this data to compare quarter one to quarter two as we start to have conversations uh, throughout the year about different students. Here is an example of how you can go about tracking and documenting that data. So we're having a meeting. And we need to write down and keep track of who's the champion, what indicator did the student have, and also what are some things that were shared during the meeting, and what intervention did we actually come up with. So this is an Excel example of how you can do that very easily and conveniently, because this is something that you can have open at the meeting, and the recorder can actually just type the information as it's being shared during the meeting. When it comes to organizing data, schools find multiple ways to do this. Three of the most uh, common ways, should I say, that we've uh, experienced with schools keeping their data is either hard copy, Microsoft Excel, or Google Docs. So let's talk about each one of these for a little bit. <laughs> hard copy, uh, it's a lot of paper. <laughs> so um, it's going to end up being a lot of printing and uh, you're going to have to have somewhere to secure it, like in a binder. And we've seen this work phenomenally at schools. Uh, so it's up to you and what resources you have available. Uh, one downside of the hard copy is there's no way to back it up because all you have is what you printed out. And usually this type of document is kept with one person, so it's not something that everyone can easily uh, have access to as far as other teachers who share students that you've spoken with and who are interested in knowing what interventions were decided and so forth and so on. The second one is uh, one of my favorites because Excel is uh, user-friendly for me, <laughs> and I find it very easy to share. You can create past protective passwords for those documents as you're sharing student information. And then also multiple people can have access to that document via email. Uh, you can also print things out very clearly from the Excel, docu uh, Excel document and share them for future meetings. Google Docs is another one that uh, actually you can use with Excel. And we've seen a lot of schools migrate to this form because, again, it's easy to share. You can update it. You can input live data, and also multiple people can have access to the document to provide different updates without having to send the information back and forth. They can log on and update the Google Docs document uh, right there. So there's a variety of ways to organize data, and you can reach out to us uh, if you have any questions about those three different ones that I just shared with you. 
So I have great pleasure in uh, introducing and turning over the call to our, our guest uh, school today. And uh, we're going to hear from Jefferson Middle School, which is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they're going to share with us what has their EWS journey looked like and how have they implemented and have, how, how they've been able to have effective data review meetings. So please uh, sit back and listen as we hear from Sean and Liz of Jefferson Middle School. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. Thank you, Sean, for joining us. Hi, Felicia. Hi, Liz. Thank you as well. So we, we'll begin. I mean, um, I don't know if you want to skip to the first slide. Basically, uh, yeah, we, we basically started this journey because we wanted to provide support for our students and our teachers. Um, in, in New Mexico right now, teachers in the state are required to analyze data as part of their evaluation process. So we felt like, again, going back to the support for students was paramount, but we also wanted to provide support for our teachers. We thought EWS was a good jumping off point for teachers. Um, we felt teachers were struggling with analyzing data, and we thought the ABCs were real, a real simple way to um, look at data in a constructive way that has a positive impact on our students. So one of our initial goals was to raise overall staff awareness of what um, EWS was or what the ABCs are. So that was our initial step. Um, when we uh, jumped into this, we uh, went to a summer conference, which is on the, the PowerPoint right now. Myself, my assistant, the dean of students, Liz, who's sitting with me right now, and we were real, uh, and a teacher. And we were real selective with that teacher. We, we kind of figured out a teacher that we thought would champion this, and we were successful with that when we picked the teacher that we brought. We then rolled it out to the whole staff. Um, we basically told them why we were doing this, this work, how we thought it would benefit them and their students and their practice. We've uh, continued the journey by having Felicia come to Jefferson and work with our leadership team. We've also gone to another state training, which was, I think, about a month ago, um, to get some further training. So that's basically our training and our background and why we got into this EWS work, which we're finding is, we're finding to be very uh, challenging, but very uh, rewarding, I guess. So to get the teachers to buy in, um, we had it was critical I mean we we needed the teacher buy-in for this to work um the first thing we did is like I said we were real selective on who we chose to go with us on the, the first training when we picked the teacher that we picked we, we we looked at different qualities but we really wanted someone that would champion this when they brought the program back to the school um, so it's very critical that you get the right teachers initially to buy into this and we think we were successful with that teacher so when we came back to the school with the program or with the process and the system, we decided we would work with our teachers so that they um, would have support. So it wasn't like we're just saying, hey, here's this system, please try this. We basically said, we're gonna do, we're gonna work with you throughout this process. We're gonna help you develop your goals around this process. We're gonna do everything that we need to do so that you will be successful in this process. So we put it out to the teachers. We basically said we needed three teams. We wanted a sixth grade team, a seventh grade team, and an eighth grade team. We told them that we would we'd provide their PDP support. In New Mexico, every teacher has to provide a professional development plan yearly. So we, we told them we would work as a team to come up with the goal and then the, the verbiage and the wording so that they could plug it into their PDP. We also provided them with the mid-year um, goal, not, not the mid-year the mid review verbiage, 
um, so that, you know, as a team, we're coming up with the goals um, so that they felt supported. And, and when we talked about it, we had actually a, another middle school come yesterday um, to the school and visit and sit with our, one of our teams to kind of look at, like, see an overview of the process. One of the teachers said that was one of the, the, the carrots, one of the hooks that we were willing to help them with their professional development goal. So we, we basically put it out there to them. We um, let them have a weekend to think about it. We also can't, in, in our APS, we're not allowed to dictate what the, what the teachers, um, I guess I'm trying to think of the word, but what teachers do through their PLCs, it's totally up to them um, through the union. The union gives them the right to decide whatever they want to do through their PLC. That's their right. They do have to address the four defer questions but they basically can do pretty much anything through a PLC. So we gave them the weekend to think about it. They came back, three teams came back and said, yes, we want to do EWS. So this next slide is just a, some examples of our school-wide interventions that you know impact a large group, if, if not the majority of our students that need it. Um, we have them listed there. They range from our health and wellness team, uh, a student assistance team. We're excited about a couple things here at our school that we've implemented. We're currently a community school. Mr. Morris has initiated that and um, you know we're trying to build that community here and uh, we have a coordinator who works with us to help bring in outside resources as well. Um, we have a 21st century program which is before and after school that offers tutoring and uh, different clubs that offer kids safe places and give them that one-on-one -on -one attention if they need some academic support. Um, we also are very strong with our restorative justice practices. Um, we've built our Student Success Center, which is our in-school suspension room, to build on the restorative justice and keep our kids in school instead of suspending them outside of school. So we really try to focus on the positive behavior. Um, to address uh, behaviors overall in school and keep kids in the right track. Um, we have also some other things like Brotherhood and a Native American Club that reach a specific groups. Um, this next slide is uh, it, uh, takes a look at our some grade level work. This is our eighth grade team, um, some members of the team, and uh, their goals when they meet, and this is what we, were, we presented them with, was identifying students with, at the time, we were looking at unexcused absences, and now we know it's all absences that we really want to look at. Um, identify students who are failing either math or language arts, identify students who might be exhibiting concerning behaviors, and then really talk and, and discover what might be the possible barriers and, and why these kids are struggling, whether it be home, school, organization, you know, conflict with teacher, that kind of thing. And then we brainstorm together as a team and, and uh, put some support systems together um, for, for identified students. Um, the next slide is our seventh grade team, and this is our champion team as a whole. Um, Ms. Uh, Roy Ball is pictured here. She's the one teacher who attended our summer conference, and she's just been an amazing lead, lead person, and this team has just been phenomenal. Um, uh, the seventh grade team, we've, we've had several uh, parent conferences. Um, we utilize their PLC time, which is their prep time. Um, to call students in and do conferences one-on-one. -on -one. We ask parents to come in during this time. We do phone conferences. We develop specific plans to address needs of students. Um, the eighth grade team, which was pictured before, uh, they are very good at uh, creating even just very fine detailed plans such as, you know, a teacher volunteering to pull a kid in during their, their prep to clean out their backpack, get them folders, you know, get them a binder, um, you know, because if we thought that that was one of their barriers, that they were not organized, um, we're doing those types of things. So nothing is, you know, we, we put some crazy ideas out there and nothing's too crazy for us to try because we're seeing some growth and success with our kids and um, that's kind of where we're at. Anybody talking about next steps? Yeah, so next steps, um, what we're planning on doing going forward is kind of building on what we've done so far, but we want to, we have basically two sixth grade teams, two seventh grade teams, two eighth grade teams, and so on. We're sending a few more teachers this year to the, the state training because we're hoping that since they've witnessed some of the successes of the other teams that 
they'll bring that back to their team, to their PLC, and that'll be a goal that they decide, like, they'll decide as a group, we're, we're, we're willing to work on EWS too, and then eventually it'll be school-wide. So that's one of the things. Um, one of the things that we're finding is that we're just constantly adapting and evolving. Um, nothing's perfect at this stage. I don't think you can ever get to that point, but we're always trying to figure out new ways to enhance what we're doing, to change what we're doing, um, listen for feedback so that we can kind of continue to move forward. Um, some of the things, like I said on there, we're working with the district on fine tuning the data collection process. Right now, the process isn't as smooth as we would like it to be. It, it's a little bit of give and take from the district, but basically they, they provide some of the data, but then we have to cut and paste and do some different things because the, in the format that they're providing the data right now, it's a little cumbersome. Um, it's all right for like a leadership team, but it is cumbersome for like an individual teacher team. Uh, it's not really easy for them to look at, and it kind of gets away from the premise of the ABCs in terms of just attendance behavior and the core content grade. Um, we're also looking at ways that we can really find a champion for every student that we have that falls on the EWS spreadsheet. Um, we also are an AVID school, so we're kind of trying to figure out ways we can marry some of these systems. So it's not recreating the wheel, it's just creating different supports and different interventions within systems that we have at the school. One last thing too that we want to add that we didn't put on this slide uh, was educating our families and really reaching out to the parents and letting, letting them know what EWS is and what that means and why it's important and sharing, you know, the data of, of you know, what, how kids can be successful, what they need to be successful. And so that's a part of our next step. And we're also working with our feeder high school. So we're excited about that. Because we, yeah, one of the things with the high school is we want to be able to, when our eighth graders leave, we want to be able to turn over some names to our high school. We have two feeder high schools. We want to be able to give them some of the, the, the families, some of the names of the children and the families that we've been working with so that the supports and the interventions don't stop once they leave Jefferson. They continue because we all know once they get to ninth grade, it's going to be just as challenging um, or more challenging than eighth grade. And we want them to continue to have those supports and those interventions so that they're successful in high school. And if something worked here at Jefferson, why not just keep on doing what's working at the high school level so that that student's successful? So this slide is, is staying the course and trying to keep people focused at this difficult time of the year. This next week is our spring break. So we really try to make a point to celebrate our successes. And as, as much as we need to identify our needs of improvement, we need to celebrate the things we are doing well and, and go ahead and talk about things that didn't work so well and, and set new goals and challenge ourselves. Um, here there's pictures of uh, some uh, um, assemblies that we have to celebrate clean jet cards, which is our behavior accountability system. Um, and uh, teachers just doing really great things to keep things positive here at Jefferson. Um, the last slide uh, is just a few things that are also extra things that are happening here um, that help us remember why we do this work. We have an amazing staff. We, we are trying to recognize our students of the month and be better about that. We're bringing parents in for homework diner and um, community members. Um, Sean, I don't know if you want to talk about the Goodwill Deeds. Yeah, I mean, the Goodwill Deeds is a way that, you know, families can donate um, items that they no longer use, and then we get a portion of the money back from Goodwill. The Homework Diner is a great example on the bottom of a way that we connect with families. It's also a support and intervention. We provide a free meal. Families come in. They get homework um, support with teachers. They stay late that night, uh, usually run from about 5 to 7.30. And teachers work with the kids on homework, and families get have a free meal so they don't have to worry about cooking. for When they get home at 7.30, the, the meal is provided, and that's all free. Um, we also have a lot of different clubs, which are serve as different supports for different ethnic groups that we here, have here at Jefferson. Um, so those are all, again, supports that we use within this process. But again, under the umbrella of, like, we're a community school, we're using EWS. It's all kind of under the same umbrella. These are all supports and interventions that we use so that we can support our kids. And hopefully the goal is that our kids then continue to move on, graduate in four years, and that's our overall goal. So we thank you. Appreciate um, the time and the ability, having the, the, op, the ability to present for you guys today. 
great. Thank you, Sean and Liz. I um, appreciate you guys sharing. Um, this is Johan again. Um, so I will. I have a couple of things, um, but I will. I'm going to pass it off to Dentel for a minute here. If there are any questions for Felicia um, or Sean and Liz about uh, what we have so far, um, and then I have a couple of a uh, couple of final things before we end. No questions have come through on the chat, Johan. Okay. Um, I have one for Sean and Liz for you guys. Um, just a question on it. I mean, you guys talked a lot about kind of getting buy-in from your staff, which sounds like was really um, a big piece of your success, was trying to get them, you know, getting their buy-in and their ownership over what was happening. Um, so questions about the, specifically about the meeting. It sounds like people kind of got the concept. So one, are there particular things that you guys did that helped, you felt like helped your teams, um, you know, have effective meetings? Um, and then two, if there are things that you would recommend for someone who's just new to this. So it might have been something you did or might not have been, but so kind of two parts. Things you did that really helped them run effective meetings, and then second one, if you, some giving advice to a new person, what would it be? One of the things that, you know, just to reiterate what Sean said is definitely getting the right lead teacher, but also to, I, I went to all of the meetings um, to help facilitate that. So I was very dedicated to going into their PLCs and being there with them, you know, being a part of that team. And I would really uh, recommend something like that where you do have someone who has a little bit more um, knowledge base, um, you know, that's willing to do that work. And, and I did step up and, you know, get that going as far as I'll do this, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk to the nurse, I will touch base with the counselor. And then gradually it it rolled into them like because I can't always be there I have situations that go on at school that I can't be there and they've begun to own that and roll it but I think that being very consistent at first having a facilitator a strong facilitator um, really made a difference and that's one thing I would suggest uh, to people just starting out we also I mean we also put out a, a basically like a two-page document and listed how we were going to support them and what was required from them um, when we would meet, so we kind of just laid out the whole process for them, so that you know, stu so that teachers that are visual learners, they they could see that because a lot of them at first kind of were trying to wrap their head around, well, what does this look like? Um, and we so we gave them those supports, we gave them that document. Once they received that, once Liz was sitting in on the meetings with them, I think they felt more comfortable. They felt like, yeah, we are receiving supports, we can do this, and it's grown over time. And sticking with those three. The ABCs is critical. That would be another advice I would give to a leader, leadership team that's trying to implement. Don't make it bigger than that. It really needs to stay small and focused because that's very doable and it doesn't feel overwhelming for teachers. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we had one other question come in. Um, and uh, oh, it's a, I think around the homework diner that you guys had. Um, so a quick question on it. So you, it sounds like you guys have students engaged in working on their homework. Are is there something that what are parents engaged in during that time? Well, parents can do homework too. I mean, we provide support so that the parents can learn how to work with their students around certain content areas. Um, so that's one option. Um, sometimes the sometimes it's networking for the parents. Um, we have different events during the night too so like we might pair up homework diner with financial literacy night so that parents actually that need some help developing a budget or whatnot they can you know they have dinner with their family the, then the student then works on homework and the parent then um, gets um, some support in regards to financial literacy um, right now we're looking at having one, a homework diner where students will um, get homework support, families will eat dinner together, and then the parents will um, have a chance to talk with lawyers um, regarding um, immigration status, that kind of thing, um, just because there's a lot of fears out there and um, this provides families and parents with the support they need so that they can be successful and their students can be successful. Okay, great. 
Um, all right. Um, well, thank you, guys. Um, I think we're just about at time, so um, I'll go uh, to one more final thing that I'm going to share, and then I'll pass it back to Dantel. So, um, so again, thanks to Sean um, and Liz for uh, presenting um, kind of what it looks like for their school. Um, appreciate the getting the perspective on that. Um, and I would just uh, before I pass it back to Dantel for closing thoughts, I just when you think about early warning systems, you know, we think about this as both the data side and the, the intervention side. And really with ABC data intervention meetings is where these, these two come together, right? So we need them both to be working really well in order um, for it to happen. So, um, so we want to think about both sides of that as we're working on, on early warning systems. So, um, all right, I will pass it back to you, Dantel. Okay, thank you very much for attending today. We hope you found it helpful and informative. Please complete the short survey on today's webinar and reach out for additional information. And our website will be live shortly. Enjoy the rest of your day.